I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI. We automate billions of dollars in research and development tax credits to help innovators become successful. Today's session is brought to you by Boast AI in partnership with Launch Academy, Growth Lasers, Founder Institute, Lazaridis Institute, and BCF Ventures. So I'm, I'm really excited about this topic today because it talks about outcomes and exits. And you know, I've been a founder a couple of times. I've been a part of a few venture-backed companies. And the media has us believe that the only path to success is raising lots of money, hyper growing, and then either going cash or crash, IPO, exit, or fail. But that's okay for a small subset of companies, but it doesn't apply to the vast majority of software companies and SaaS companies that are creating value, vast majority of innovators. And uh, I've seen this, I've been a part of companies funded by PE, I've been a part of companies funded by VC, I've been a part of now Boast is Bootstrap, we just raise money. And, and you know, what happens is as founders, we tend to take care of ourselves last, right? We think about the business, the business, the growth, the big vision, the mission, the movement, the madness, our families become collateral damage. And a while ago, I talked to this great founder called Jaffer, who was the founder of Lupio, he talked about Think about what your personal definition of success is, how much money you want to have in the bank account. And I want to, I want to sort of read them off as we go along. But he, but he said was, as a founder, think about how long you want to run the business for. Is there a version of the company that you don't want to run? And how much money do you want to see in your bank account? What, what is your personal definition of success? But the thing is, when the media skews personal definition of success with hyper growing and raising hundreds of millions of dollars with even the market right now, Everyone is thinking, oh man, I just got to raise lots of money. I got to go on this hamster wheel, hyper grow, and then go cash or crash. And Bart, my good friend, Bart McDonald here, he's the founder of Bloom Ventures, one of the experts in the acquisition PE and investing space. I wanted to bring him here to tell us everything about alternate paths to acquisition and exits for founders. And um, I've had a good relationship with Bart over the last uh, couple of years. I'm also an investor in one of Bloom Ventures companies as an LP in their uh, SPV in their fund. So Bart, welcome to Traction. Thanks for joining us. Lloyd, right. thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Awesome. And you've got a decade of success leading venture-backed software businesses as a founder, CEO, other exec roles, and then also leading turnaround efforts for a lower mid-market technology private equity firm. Give us your backstory, man. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, thanks. I think, I think it's you know, always important to uh, to start out that you know, very much came from the operator background, just like yourself, Lloyd, and I assume a lot of the folks uh, dialing in and, and kind of, you know, watching this, this cast here on, on, on Traction. So, you know, kind of wind, winding back a, well, a couple of years. So I grew up, personally grew up in, in Sydney, Australia. Um, you know, what was really, I guess, unique for my upbringing was that I was surrounded by a, a family full of entrepreneurs. So uh, I guess dinner, dinner time conversations was always pretty spirited conversations, listening to you know, my, my parents, different business ventures and, and, and adventures. And I really, at an early age, came to know two things. One, that I, I wanted to be a, a builder, an entrepreneur, an operator, a CEO. Um, and I really wanted to be doing that you know, on, on the internet. And I also quickly realized that I, I wasn't the sort of guy to be, uh, to be building consumer-facing apps. You know, the, the, the TikTok, the Clubhouse, that wasn't me. I, I kind of found that, I guess, you know, a lot of people think entrepreneurs are just massive risk takers. And I, I don't actually quite agree with that. And it's probably going to come out as a theme throughout the conversation today. I think it's all around calculated risk or, or kind of stacking the odds to have the lowest amount of risk and the highest amount of you know, success or, or ROI on time, dollars spent. So I always thought, look, actually going into enterprise software you know, there's kind of uh, dedicated budgets. There's a you know, significant problem that can be communicated and kind of have that pairing between a problem with an enterprise and, and, a, and a solution in terms of a technology product. And so started very early in my career uh, going into enterprise software, uh, building both bootstrapped and, and then ultimately investor-backed businesses from a young age. And almost six years ago now, after working for a US headquartered uh, startup all throughout Asia Pacific, I guess fell, fell uh, you know, victim to the, the SF startup bug. And so moved out to San Francisco quite uh, stereotypically with a, a backpack and, and a dream and, and not much more. And over the next four years, I you know, just had the most wild roller coaster and just the incredible personal and professional journey uh, being in that, I guess, the, the SF startup movie, 
you know, starting a company with one of my best friends from, from back in Australia, who's also out in San Francisco, building an amazing product and, and company and community. And, and of course be backed by world-class investors like Gradient, who's uh, the early stage fund out, coming out of Google and other very prominent angels. And um, you know, at that point, we're also very fortunate to go through uh, a successful exit and, and an acquisition um, coming out of that business. And so as I kind of proverbially took some time on the beach after that next exit, you know, I kind of worked out that for me, you know, I'd been exposed to starting to do a lot more investing and I really loved the opportunity to be involved in not just one company, but to be involved in building many companies concurrently. Uh, but I also loved my experience and, and sort of skill set as a, a builder and an innovator. And so I was kind of, I guess, faced with a, a crossroads, you know, one was either continue going down and building other software companies. And I knew there was a lot of risk in kind of that zero to one phase, kind of on that you know, zero to 10 point journey of idea to exit. And obviously a lot of the risk is all in that zero to one phase where you're trying to find you know, customer validation. I think Lloyd, you and I have spoken offline about this several times around you know, various entrepreneurial journeys we've had where it's taken six, 12 months even to get product market fit or what you think is product market fit, but it's really a, a mirage, an oasis and you have to kind of shut the business down. And so I, I started thinking, hang on, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of things happening in the market. Um, you know, on, on one side, we, we really believe that SaaS is still in its first innings and there's this rising tide. Like it's never been easier today to start a software company right? compared to the cost, the difficulty, the amount of experts that are out there on the talent side, even 10 years ago, it's far easier today. So there's kind of this rising supply line. You know, secondly, just as what you mentioned in, in the intro, I think we're seeing more and more founders realizing that you know, maybe for them, for personal circumstances, but professional goals, and maybe there's just been this change in the narrative in, in the media, but it's not all about, you know, boom or bust in that there are other exit ramps where it's, you know, it's perfectly respectable uh, and, you know, can actually make a huge life-changing impact financially to sell a business that's doing $3 million, $6 million, $16 million of revenue um, and to actually create a great, uh, you know, return to the, to the founders, to their time, and obviously to any other shareholders around that. So we saw there was kind of increasing supply of businesses and then also increasing demand of founders that maybe wanted to look for an exit ramp a little earlier, kind of like a, a smaller, the earliest stages of these companies built out. And then personally, I, I started really shifting from being a full-time operator to then operating and investing and you know, really got bitten by the bug of, of investing uh, as well. And so there were those kind of three personal inflection points which allowed us to start Bloom uh, now a couple of years ago. Bloom is a early stage uh, private equity firm. We effectively uh, find and, and acquire and then help grow other uh, mature vertical software SaaS businesses uh, as well. And I guess I'll pause for a minute there on, on the background, but happy to, to jump in and, and talk a little bit more about Bloom and certainly some of the things that we're seeing in market today and you know, potentially some options for other founders listening in as they might consider exit opportunities. Awesome. So Bart, what sort of companies interest you? Like what is what is the ideal customer profile for Bloom? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So really, really short, we, we look for, uh, and I'll kind of you know describe this in a, in a moment in like as a double click. So mature vertical SaaS businesses with one to $10 million of revenue. So to kind of unpack that and like explain why each of those keywords are important. So for, for us in, in mature businesses, we're always looking for market leaders. You know, we, we like to find businesses where there's a strong, uh, you know, reporting cycle of you know, operating metrics in a business. And, and most importantly, a really mature product. We, we don't like buying uh, or, or acquiring companies that, um, you know, have only been in market for a couple of months or maybe a year and there isn't a full cycle of kind of customer contract data we really like to be able to find these businesses that got mature product really strong product market fit secondly we, we like going into really vertical markets um, you know again the distinction between horizontal versus vertical is you know software that's developed for uh, specific niches or, or clientele so for example building software specifically for the legal or real estate or sales professional versus you know, project management software, which kind of anyone can use for multiple different use cases. You know, the, the reason there is that, you know, we, we typically see in horizontal markets, you know, because of the size of those market opportunities are so much larger in oftentimes, 
it means that there's a lot of venture backed players. And so where we see, you know, in industries where there's a lot of leading or kind of VC money going to work in marketing and, and sales, we like to kind of steer clear of them to kind of reduce the competitive headwinds. But secondly, we also know with, with vertical software solutions, you know, typically if, you, if you've been building product for many years, you, you, it, it just really creates high switching costs for a lot of uh, you know, the clientele using the, that, that business's software product as well. And so typically we find them high quality businesses uh, under the kind of mandate that a private equity owner uh, is looking for. And then lastly, SaaS, you know, we're, we're kind of quite unique over here at Bloom in that we only acquire software as service businesses. And again, one of the things that we, we absolutely love and have a, a really firm mandate around that is just how high quality and recurring the revenue is from these sticky customers. I mean, said differently, what we've just seen time and time again with businesses, we've, you know, we've spoken to so many amazing founders over the last year who experienced headwinds because of COVID. And what they said is like, look, sales have actually slowed down. You know, like we were, you know, in 2019, we were bringing in 200 customers a quarter, for example, in 2020, we were only bringing in 120. However, the total amount of revenue actually continued increasing because they're able to expand their existing customers in the business, um, you know, by unlocking additional value, different seats, different functionality. So that's one of the reasons that we, we really love focusing on these mature vertical SaaS businesses doing around one to $10 million of ARR. Definitely. So Bart, let's discuss exit paths for founders. What are some of the options you see available for founders today? You're in the PE world, but there's M&A, there's IPO, there's SPAC. Maybe give us a rundown and then maybe conclude with the PE. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a you know, caveat, non-exhaustive list. I think, I think in, at a high level, I think the options that are available to founders really depends at what stage of growth? You know, are these, is this a, a startup company that's you know, been in market for three quarters with a couple of hundred thousand dollars of revenue? Yeah, great. Is this a scale up company that's maybe at five to $10 million of, of revenue that's raised venture capital and they've only been in market for two years because of the, the expectations or the, the valuation that's been set by these VC type investors? Maybe they're doing five million of revenue, but they're already over a hundred million dollar valuation or above $50 million valuation, whatever it is. Well, maybe they're, they're bootstrapped and they're in the 20 to $50 million range. It really just depends on you know, what the size of the business is but from a, the, the startup to scale up continuum and then what the valuation expectations are. So there's obviously a, a couple of different options here. You know, one, and, and I think this is certainly, um, you know, quite harmful to be to be completely frank is my kind of view view on this now and, and someone that really fell for this or was I guess influenced by this a lot earlier in my, my career as well is kind of the the idea to IPO route you know like you as a founder your you know your identity is inextricably linked to this baby you're birthing as this you know professional entity and you know really it's a case of like the, the more successful you are is like you have to go through these different rungs you know like it's cool to sell to a private equity buyer but it's even cooler to ipo and to be like ringing the bell as everyone says and so some of those those options you know, obviously here in the united states you've got different exchanges like the new york stock exchange or the nasdaq exchange i won't kind of go into the differences but one thing that i've been fascinated to learn more about and i think again lloyd we actually share some some friends in in, in common here is understanding that there are actually different types of public listing exchanges. So, you know, actually up in, in, in Canada, the TXX or the Toronto Stock Exchange, they have a, a junior arm called the, the TSXV, which is the, the Toronto Venture Exchange. Um, that's kind of similar to the OTC or over-the-counter exchange here in the United States. You know, Australia has something similar to the ASX. I think the Frank Frankfurt in Germany has a similar exchange. It's basically, these are for businesses that are actually at a, a smaller scale. Maybe they're not doing, you know, 50 to $100 million of revenue. Maybe they're only doing, you know, a couple of hundred thousand up to, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars of revenue. But again, the concept is, is quite similar. You're effectively selling shares uh, to both institutional and retail investors via a, a liquid exchange. So that kind of, uh, is, is kind of one area again you know the, the, the exchanges that are available to founders really does depend on, on certain factors typically around the size or the, the enterprise value and the market cap secondly uh, you know I'd say a much much more common route 
is uh, going through M and A, and I'll kind of talk about M and A or like mergers and acquisitions, really through the lens of a strategic acquirer. Um, you know, I think strategically, um, you know, there there are two different camps of of, of uh, companies that go and buy other companies, right? You know, the example I know you've had Jeff Lawson on from Twilio. I'm a huge fan of Jeff as well. You know, I think about Twilio acquiring segment is a great acquisition because there's strategic overlap. You know, Twilio had to make an assessment. We either need to buy or build a product like this um, or partner. And in this case, we're going to go and uh, you know, buy it because there's huge synergies we can get from cross-selling, integrating product roadmaps, et cetera. Oftentimes you'll also see competitors buying other competitors really just to take them out of market. Um, I'm not really as much of a fan of that because I think, you know, whilst it creates an outcome per se for founders, you know, there's usually post post integration challenges that, that, that can around that can arise. But certainly in the area of, of mergers and acquisitions, you know, I, I think, you know, I, and I've advised a lot of founders, uh, you know, who are sub $10 million of revenue here to just to really think about particularly venture capital or VC backed founders. You know, oftentimes they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm shooting for the moon. You know, I'm, I'm at a million dollars of revenue. I've, I've just closed a, a series A. I'm now valued over X millions and I'm, I'm going to take this all the way to IPO. And then someone comes knocking and says, hey, we'll, we'll give you, you know, 25 million, 30 million, 50 million, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think it, it, it really requires founders to take pause and really assess because there's this different, and I kind of think Jason Lemkin talks a little bit about this, um, as, as a quite a famous founder turned investor of kind of this local versus global maximum. You know, once you get to kind of post scale, um, you know, call it, you know, 25, $50 million of revenue, the, the universe of potential companies that are large enough to actually acquire you at a business doing, call it $25 million at a 10 X revenue valuation. So $250 million is actually incredibly small compared to the universe of companies that can buy, you know, a $2 million business for 20 million or for $10 million of revenue. Um, those types of acquisitions happen every single day. You're just not seeing them on TechCrunch or on the, the, the headlines. You know what? I think let's take a moment to poll the audience. Are you at 1 million revenue? Are you at five? Maybe put one five or uh, if it's higher then just type higher. If it's lower, <laughs> if, uh, awesome. Great. Uh, so we know the spectrum. So, so, so closing, so closing up, I mean, on, on M and A in particular, because they're deemed or kind of a, a synonymous word for like M and A is like a strategic acquire. So it's not an investment firm. It's usually another product, a software company that would be acquiring another smaller software company. The reason they do that is there's usually some sort of strategic imperative or a strategic initiative or unlock, you know, um, where Twilio, we want to be able to have data piping and all the analytics that come from segment. It's going to cost us how many tens, hundreds of millions of dollars and the time to, be able to have that product in market. Let's just go and buy them. And so because of the assessment they make, typically the, the, the multiples or the valuation that a strategic acquire would pay up for a um, in, in sort of purchasing another entity would be a lot higher than other forms of, of an exit, which I'll come to next, which is, is kind of the world of, of private equity. And private equity are more corporate or financial buyers. They're typically buying you know, businesses as a, as a standalone to say, hey, I'm, you know, I've, I've made a, a created a thesis that, you know, with COVID, I think there are going to be certain industries that are, are major benefactors of, you know, work from home. And so as, as an example of that, it, it's kind of, you know, sales software for re remote sales workers in, in the kind of knowledge based industry. So they create this thesis around kind of an industry and what's the tailwind behind it. And then they'll go looking for businesses within that industry. Um, but as a result, you know, tip some private equity firms to aren't as kind of operationally enabled. And so they really just make a, a, a investment decision purely off a model or for, or for a spreadsheet of kind of, you know, just one plus one equal two here. Um, and as a result, you know, the, the way that they need to make their numbers work is that the, the exit um, and the outcomes for founders can be slightly less. Um, and that, that's something that I think has been really shrouded in, in the industry for a long time. But again, happy to talk a, a lot more about that. One thing that is, is really exciting to, to hear and something that we identified a couple of years ago is that 
going back even, you know, five, 10 years back, you know, SaaS was still software as a service recurring revenue business was still very much in its infancy, you know, you know compared to how prolific it is and accepted um, as, a, as a business model today. And financial buyers, you know, typically didn't buy software companies, you know, below $10 million of revenue or a certain level of EBITDA or kind of profit in, inside of a business. And something that we've seen is just a major shift that's happened in the last couple of years is as investors have now really started to appreciate how high quality these SaaS or software businesses are, the quality of, of, of revenue is kind of almost annuities um, that, that they actually now have started coming down and saying, you know what, if you have a business that's even a million dollars of revenue, you know, even less than that, we'll actually start acquiring them. And I think there's, you know, examples of brokers or investment bankers that are now focusing on smaller and smaller companies, you know, um, marketplaces online like microacquire.com and, and others that are now, you know, in, enabling and empowering um, founders or kind of sellers as a founder to connect directly with buyers themselves and, and sell software businesses, you know, at, at scales such as $25,000, $50,000 of revenue. So it really has been this pretty incredible change that we've seen in the market in the last few years. Awesome. So we got a range of folks, right? Folks from 1 million to, I, see, I saw folks here with 20 million plus in revenue. Uh, and there's a lot of questions and we had that in, in, our, in our track as well is like, how do you think about multiples that you expect from PE versus strategic buyers? Now, uh, walk us through that, like the multiple game, but also what sort of metrics command those multiples, right? Like what, what are you seeing sort of uh, at different multiple levels, what sort of metrics are you seeing from a ARR perspective, from a month over month growth, from a customer acquisition cost churn? Like you had some ideas of what is the ideal fit and then how do those differ PE versus strategic buyers? Yeah, so you know, there's, there's kind of a couple, couple of ways to, to slice that. Um, you know, stri strategic buyers, the way that they create a model which then computes or spits out the kind of multiple that they will pay up or the valuation for a business, they, they have to run fundamentally like a, a different um, mathematical analysis. And, and that really, really just comes down to like, do we buy, build or partner? You know, like I'm gonna you know, maybe fairly unfairly kind of go keep going back to the example of like Twilio versus Segment, right? This is, this is a company that, you know, would, in order to, to build that product, build that kind of sales enablement machinery um, for, for Twilio in-house, would just take far too long and cost far too much potentially. And so their analysis was, hey, we actually need to go out and it makes sense for acquire it. Now, there's probably two things. One is really like what the absolute amount of revenue is. So, you know, what the actual size of the company, you're going to get a different valuation for a company that's, you know, a million dollars of revenue growing 25% month on month, but that was started a year ago versus a business that's doing, you know, over a hundred million dollars of revenue. You know, you're really looking at the scale and the maturity of, um, and the professionalization of the entire organization there. And so that's where it's, it's kind of not uncommon to see, you know, valuations of some of these post scale technology businesses being acquired in the 10, 20, even 30 X forward revenue forecasts. And how do you define forward? What is forward? Is forward 12 months or is forward two years? Again, it, it, it depends. I mean, that would come down to kind of negotiation by negotiation, but it's, it's not uncommon to kind of have a, look, here's a forecast of where, you know, we're in middle of 2021. Uh, here's a forecast, what we think we're going to be printing up to December uh, 31, 2022. And we want a multiple of, of that. Um, that's, you know, definitely seeing more and more of that again, as, acquirers are, are realizing just how valuable um, the, these software entities can, can become. Now, obviously it, it differs with private equity, um, as I said, in terms of the, the, the computations, you know, for them, it's not, it's not a case of strategic unlock, um, unless the acquiring entity is, you know, what's called like a tuck-in or an add-on to a, a larger existing entity that they, they may have bought. So let's say, for example, a private equity firm buys a, a company with $30 million of revenue in in 2021 and then a year later they find that there's this new upstart in market or maybe it's someone that's been around for, for six or seven years and they're doing five million dollars of revenue and again there's synergies there it's a complementary product um, it enables the, the existing parent company to kind of grow even faster sometimes private equity firms will come in and actually acquire multiple companies 
in the same industry, but the first company is usually the largest. It's the, it's called the platform. And then they'll do a bunch of other add on or tuck in acquisitions as part of that strategy as well. Now the, the valuations, again, it really depends on kind of, you know, what scale of growth the company is at in, in an absolute, you know, where are they at today? Is it a company that's doing North of $10 million of revenue with 50 employees, multiple hundred, you know, a very diverse customer base, uh, high margins across the business at both you know growth and net margins that's going to be valued significantly higher and you know again to go to a, another side of the, the table here you see someone like vista which is a, a mega cap private equity firm buying game site in in q4 of last year i think if i'm not mistaken game site was you know at around or maybe even over 100 million of, of revenue um you know and that was kind of north of, of, of 10x now my numbers could be slightly off there, but certainly you see private equity investors also paying up significant multiples um, for businesses that are at that $100 million. Now, as you come down, certainly below the, the, the 10 and $5 million mark, you know, those multiples come down a little bit less as, as well. And that's pretty consistent across the board. Awesome. There's a, there's a consistent theme of questions here that I want to take, right? When, one is, when is the right time for founders to think about PE? versus strategic like when is when is that uh that window yeah that's a that, that, that that's a that's a great question so sometimes um look i think in, in an ideal world let's, let's kind of reconstruct that question i'm a founder i put my heart sweat tears soul into building a company i want to get the largest financial and professional success possible right if i'm hearing that strategic acquires can at times pay up more, um, and I can like financially make more money selling to a strategic advice, a strategic buyer versus another type of buyer. Well, let's go and do that. Um, again, it's it's nuance. So why would that may not make sense? Well, number one, it, it may not be there may not be an obvious strategic buyer in in the market, right? And I see this a, a lot of times in in industries where a company's gone up to. 20 million, 30 million of revenue, and there just isn't. It's not, it's not a, you know, a fang or someone that's kind of, you know, an Adobe, one of these public listed companies, there just isn't a an obvious acquirer to come out. So that that could be one one example. And maybe it where you kind of at that kind of 15 to 50 million dollars of revenue, or maybe you're even smaller. Maybe it's a case of you're at one to five million dollars of revenue, and there's just, you know, you, you've spoken to a few strategic acquirers, they've said, hey, we think there's too much overlap on the product. We don't think you've got enough revenues. I, I, I see this a lot, you know, companies that have, um, you know, we have a conversation with on the private equity side, they have previously tried to, to be acquired by a, um, by a strategic. And, you know, I think the key lesson there is that you know, companies get bought, they don't get sold. You know, oftentimes I, I rarely hear an example that's not an aqua hire, that's a true multiple where a founder says, I want to sell to this company. You know, business is doing great. I just, I just want to sell now. And so then you reach out to your competitors or other strategic acquirers to try to sell. It's usually the, 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 the higher multiples from a strategic comes when that third party comes inbound and says, hey, we love what you're doing. We really need you. you know, what's your number? That's kind of one example. A second example is around speed. You know, again, this may not fit all, all founders' model here, but sometimes things happen. You know, there are co-founder issues. Um, someone's retiring, right? And we're, we're literally acquiring a business right now where uh, one of the owners is has been planning for a retirement for a few years. Uh, COVID sent that plan sideways, and you know, as as kind of the fog started clearing, they said, right, we we, we want to go out and and you know, effectively, we we want to complete an acquisition here in, in 2021. Um, so, you know, that's another, another, another reason. Um, but again, there's obviously, you know, caveats. I mean, one, one other thing that we, we typically see as well is just having an understanding of what you want post acquisition, right? I think a lot of time founders get enamored and start seeing dollar signs far too um, simply and far too early in a in a process or a conversation around some sort of exit. And an example is like, well, thinking through what's going to happen post an acquisition. You, you know, sometimes you know a lot of time founders get into the role of being a founder because they want to have independence. They want to have freedom of being able to make the decisions. Um, they want to, to build a business a certain way. You know. How, how are they going to be motivated 
um, on a you know three, four, five year vesting program at a, at a new acquirer um, where they've then got to report into five other layers of management and potentially the product they've been building for years you know, gets dissolved at the, at the start of the year two because of a strategic shift. There are also some of the reasons to consider um, around you know, both the pros and cons of a, of a strategic acquisition. Definitely. And then there's this whole layer of, uh, of sort of growth equity that's coming um, into play, right? Where you sort of don't sell the majority at the same time, you're not raising for a hyper grow that, that you're probably not fit for a traditional Silicon Valley VC, but you have good unit economics, you have good business principles, and you raise from growth equity. Tell us about that. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I'm really excited by some of the um, financial options or kind of in instruments, financial products, which creates kind of various options for founders, for management teams, for owners to run businesses in a different way. I think, look, here's a tale there. I think the kind of the, I won't name a specific media publication that we all know is it starts with a T, but I think these kind of, you know, in, in our industry, kind of the, the, the bylines of, of media, it, it really encourages this, you know, massive value, you know, huge amounts of money raised, massive valuations you have to grow into with all this kind of risk to the entrepreneur. You know, it, it, cel it really celebrates relevance over rich, uh, you know, um, on the kind of the founder's dilemma path. And so I, I remember, you know, building a couple of uh, companies prior and, you know, some of the investors that we had on our cap table when we were exploring, hang on, like we're, we're you know, we've decided to effectively enlarge in the scope of product it's going to take more time to hit some numbers because you know we, we effectively want to go after an even bigger opportunity, but we're already on the venture treadmill, and so we decided to you know start exploring uh, you know some venture debt, and that was just like just the, the anemic response around the table it was like whoa whoa the signal that this gives to the market this is not good, and I was like well this is just the reality a lot of founders take you know find themselves in when they're on a ten year plus journey building businesses, um, and I think that that mantra or the, the kind of the dogma, the narrative, whatever you want to call it, I think has really started shifting in that, you know, what may have been perceived as kind of second class financial products, second class way of building businesses, you know, bootstrapping, taking debt, you know, in a couple of years ago, I think today is being very much accepted and celebrated as really responsible products. So, you know, sometimes we actually, we talk to founders that say, hey, I'm, I'm just burnt out, you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, I've got a cash crunch coming up in six months and we're like, Hey, now I, I get it. I understand. I'm a founder at heart as well. Um, you know, why don't you go and take a couple of weeks out of the business and then, you know, solve for the burnout challenge. And then secondly, um, you know, financially, you don't have to go and, you know, sell hundred percent of the company. Now you can sell 51% of the company and partner up with someone like a private equity buyer, like what we do at Bloom, where we're coming with a lot of our operational experience and help kind of co-pilot the business for the next cha chapter of growth. You can sell to a growth equity firm that might take 20% and maybe it's a bootstrap business. They've never raised outside financing. They're at $4 million of revenue and they're just wanting to put some additional gas in the tank. You see that all the time now. There's plenty of great uh, investors out there that, that focus just on that. Um, and then of course, you know, debt, I think you know, there are so many amazing products, you know, Boast AI obviously has a, a suite of products as, as well that kind of provide this, this flexibility and um, just empowerment for founders to take different paths that suits their personal and professional goals. Definitely. I want to, I want to get into one thing here. There's a lot of questions are, are keying towards this is what is the, what is the key theme around P like sort of what sort of multiples is there a typical range where like and and it's important to understand founder motivations and it's also important to understand the motivations of the people you're going to get in bed with before right like if you want to raise VC um, or a strategic exit or a strategic investor it's really important to understand what are they looking at to get out of it post acquisition because likely you're going to be sticking around there for a couple of years uh, and the same way with PE, right? So what, what multiples are you seeing with PE? We know sort of what VCs are looking for. They're looking for each deal to return their fund. Um, what are we looking at with PE? What is the outcome PE wants post acquisition? And to get to there, what are the typical multiples they're willing to give founders? So let me, let me kind of il illustrate this in a slightly like medium, medium response format. 
and I'll give it with like a tale of two companies because I think if I just shared numbers straight up, it would make founders flinch and it certainly would have made me flinch hearing this as a, as a founder a few years ago, but I think it's important to understand with a bit of illustration. Let's imagine there's, there's two businesses. Business A is doing, let's call it a, a million and a half of, of revenue. Um, they've raised a little bit of venture capital. There's four or five employees in the business, maybe 30 customers. Um, metrics are, are okay. Um, and, you know, ultimately one of the founders has decided they want to go to the next thing. You know, they, they got a job opportunity elsewhere. They want to go start their next business or what happens, right? That's kind of business A. Business B is that there's a company that's doing $15 million of revenue, right? They're, they're growing consistently 75, 100% a year. Um, they've got a, an organizational chart with a really built out experienced leadership management team, you know, deep bench of talent all throughout the organization. Everything works. You know, you, you basically, you put a dollar in at the top end of marketing and you spit out $16 of, of profit on, on, the, on the back end. Um, or a, a clear path to, to, you know, to profitability. Would it be reasonable to value both business A and business B at the same way? Arguably, investors would say no, because one, one business, you know, there, there's more kind of indicators, there's more metrics that would say one business is you know, higher quality today and in a year will continue being higher quality, right? And that's obviously going to be business B. And so that's what I was saying earlier where, you know, multiples, for kind of valuations, which you know, valuations is typically it's a you know it's a multiple of either revenue or a multiple of of, of profit or you know, EBITDA depending on how fast these businesses are growing. It, it really just de depends. And so you know on a bu business B, for example, it, you know something that's that's you know already at a large base of revenue north of ten million dollars and still growing very fast. You know if you keep multiplying that out in five years, if it keeps growing at seventy five percent. You know, year one, year two, year three, that, that's a business that's going to be extremely valuable five years on. And so those investors would be happy paying up. You know, we see in market today, investors paying eight, 10, 12 times even, uh, even higher potentially on, on those types of businesses. Where I see it different, and, and this is, you know, it is, it is tough and this is where these kind of conversations just have to be like quite frank with, with founders as, as well is, you know, businesses that are doing, you know, 700,000 of revenue, 2 million of revenue. Maybe their, you know, revenue's actually gone backwards unrelated to COVID. You know, maybe that's flatlined. Um, there's, there's some issues in the business. There's a high level of churn or customer turnover. So the business objectively is just, maybe it's, it's, it's um, good. It's just not a great business like company B. And, and that's where those, those valuations may be a little different, you know, maybe around 5X or, or, or lower. Um, What's important though, and this is where some of the disconnect is, is particularly VC backed companies where they've raised a lot of money, something happens to the business and they look to sell and they've said, well, you know, we, we raised a $3 million seed round on 15, $20 million of revenue. We're doing a million dollars today. That means it's basically implied at a 20 X valuation of revenue. And I think that's where a bit of disconnect can sometimes come in into the conversation and usually just needs a bit of, um, you know, education um, from, from the private equity buyers, the, the, the financial buyers to kind of explain how they get to the multiple calculation they do. I think you just don't know, yeah. And in that spectrum, companies uh, that are sort of pre-revenue and only have good technology, but don't have traction, they would probably be on the lower end of that, that spectrum, right? That, that, um, that, that's correct. I mean, the other, the other side as well is, you know, we, we we oftentimes see, again, let's let's kind of get completely out of the headlines and get out of San Francisco for a second. I mean, to your point, you know, the, the introduction- You and me are both in San Francisco though. <laughs> sure, but I think the important thing to realize is, is not get sucked into the headlines- in 100%. That only these, you know, good, great companies, outlier companies are being built in San Francisco or in these, you know, top 10 startup hubs around the world. I think, you know, what we've, we've realized, even compared to when I moved to San Francisco, you know, almost six years ago, the world is flattening every day. And I think, you know, the, the pace of change resultant from COVID is that, you know, we're going to have these amazing hubs all, all around the world. And we're seeing that because you, you've got these businesses that are, you know, being bootstrapped, you know, they've raised a bit of outside money, they're doing a couple of million dollars of, of money, and they're just not in the, I guess, they're, they're just playing a different game. They're not part of the hype, they're not playing the venture capital game. They're just, you know, building great technology, solving customer problems, and building great 
you know, sticky businesses with, with great metrics. And a lot of those are, you know, all around the world. We speak to those companies in Italy. We speak to them in Iceland. We speak to them in Singapore. They're, they're all around the world. Clayton asked this and probably didn't register for me either. In that A versus B scenario, what was the multiple for A or B? Or you didn't disclose that, did you? No, so on a company B, let's call it like a, a post scale. So it's, it's, you know, doing north of $10 million of revenue and it has a, a growth rate north of 50% revenue. It's, you know, in market today, you can see that range anywhere. I call it large parameters here. Uh, so the founders may not accept it, but they could they could see in, uh, offers from five to 15X of, of revenue. Um, that's certainly what I, I hear in, in market. Company B, uh, a subscale company, you know, maybe it's only have a year operating history, much smaller base of revenue, nowhere near, just on, on every metric, nowhere near as high quality as company B. And in particular, importantly, one, it's kind of below, you know, $3 million of revenue, subscale, to the rate of growth, you know, it's usually 15% or less. The multiples you can see there, anywhere from, you know, two to six X. Um, again, depending on how quickly this business is, we, we see businesses that are $2 million of revenue, have raised venture capital um, and are entertaining offers of, you know, 10 to 25 X as well. So it, it kind of, it really does vary. And this is why it gets a little hazy in, in, the, in the market. But I think, you know, folks that are, Obviously, paying attention on, on, on this call and kind of you know, listening to the advice today, keep speaking to brokers, keep speaking to bankers. Obviously, I'm more than happy to speak to anyone to kind of give impartial advice as well. But certainly there is a, you know, I think a lot more education that needs to happen given the shift that's happened in the industry and the founders that are at, you know, sub $15 million of revenue today can seriously entertain selling to private equity investors. I think there's more education that needs to happen. Um, and it's starting to, which is important, but I think there's still more work to be done to educate founders on, again, the different exit paths that are available to them and what it would look like financially and post acquisition to be on the private equity journey. Definitely. And one thing I want to point out is folks think that uh, right now the interest rates are low. And I've talked to, I interview two people every week on this show and I've interviewed some of the top VCs here. And uh, the general theme is that the, the, there's lots of money in the market. It's because the interest rates are low. Maybe it goes up somewhere sometime next year, late next year, and then you'll see things start to dry out, maybe. Um, but ultimately, you, you're also seeing like hedge funds and traditional banks get into venture capital because the interest rates are low and you, know, you can hedge on startups. But venture capital is a growth game. Like so... What Bart just said is company 10 million ARR growing north of 50% year over year, you can get five to 15 X. And there's a lot of companies getting 20, 30, 40 X right now. They're sort of the typical venture capital model when I see in Silicon Valley is the sort of triple, triple, double, double, double. They wanna see you three X year one, three X year two, and then double, double. And, and, and companies that are showing that kind of trajectory are commanding those kinds of multiples. But if you're growing, let's call it 15 to 50 plus percent, 15 to sub 100 percent, there is a path for you too. And that could be with private equity. And depending on where you are, that could be a five to 15 X multiple, or it could be a sub five X multiple. If you sort of have a product and it has some early traction, but we really are not interested in moving forward kind of thing. It depends at different stages. And then you may have run the company for five, 10 years and at growing at nice 40, 50, 60% year over year at 10 million in revenue, you want to cash out as a founder. So talk through, but, but, talk but through just, some of just, that. Just to, jump, just to jump in on that, because that, that, I guess this is a really interesting distinction, right? Like I think I, it was over 14 months I went without a, a salary in, in order to kind of build my last company in San Francisco. Right, and, and play the venture game. We ultimately end up raising uh, you know, a lot of money from, from venture capitalists and, and, and investors, but we mm -hmm. have very, very different money, a very different game. Because we, what we were ultimately um, you know, entirely guided by as a North Star metric of building that particular business with growth. It was literally like not growth at all costs, but like everything re was resulted around growth of net, like net ARR. That was like the most important thing. It's your, it's your one before a minute ago of you know seeing a founder that's maybe at five million dollars of revenue and we see this all the time you know, bootstrap businesses have been run for you know almost 10 years they're at four million dollars of revenue 
you know, ultimately, if you work out the math, like four million divided by 10, the, the growth rate, there is aren't necessarily outlier companies. But you speak to the founder and they're like, hey, I, I get to work 35 hour weeks. Or maybe, I, maybe I choose to work or I, I have to work 55 hour weeks, but I'm also taking half a million dollar salary or I'm, you know, these are the perks. So I think oftentimes it's, it's you know, there, there's, there's trade-offs. And I think that's really where it comes down to kind of, you know, uh, growth businesses, which is playing the venture capital game versus, you know, cash flow, lifestyle, probably like bootstrap companies where the founder either isn't able to or isn't interested in raising venture capital. Two very different models of, of building businesses. Exactly. And, and the thing is, you got to keep uh, your personal prize in mind, right? Like what is your definition of success? Because if you build somebody else's definition of success and listen to all the media hype and try to hyper grow when you're not sort of tuned to it, you're going to fail. And I've been there. Like I, I was part of Speakeasy's founding team. It was funded by Bessemer, Salesforce, great investors, but we blew through $6 million on the path to hyper grow. And and we had to shutter the company. So uh, just make sure you're building your definition of success. I mean, I, I often say, uh, having gone through it now several several times, uh, a lot of companies should, a lot of companies that are, shouldn't be taking outside capital, right? Now, and and it's because the venture capital game is, if you think about like, in like the baseball analogy, right? Venture capital, 10 balls thrown at you, venture capital is just one of them has to connect and it's a grand slam and that's the model for venture capital like it's kind of this portfolio you know portfolio theory it's, it's really you know one in ten hits is is the, is the next uber the, the next snowflake right that's what venture capitalists are looking for private equity investors are looking for you know singles and doubles it's it's connecting with nine out of ten balls singles and doubles and so it's it's incredible how many founders we've spoken to who have you know taken on a lot of money Something has then happened in the business. You know, they, they think they have product market fit. They put their foot down. They're growing really aggressively. They typically, they're, they're burning. So they're spending more money than they're making every month or more money's going out than money is coming in. And they, they say, oh my gosh, I've got four months of cash left. And, um, you know, my metrics are nowhere near at a point to be able to raise follow-on financing at a step-up valuation. You know, I've, this, this is a great business. This product needs to exist in market because we've tried to grow the business too aggressively um, because we've, we've, you know, we've partnered up with a certain type of investor and it just doesn't, doesn't work out. And, and so then they typically come and say, hey, can we sell to a private equity buyer and we can kind of take out the existing venture capital investors, keep the product, keep the team, and then run the business at a different rate of growth. Maybe that business doesn't need to grow or can't actually grow at triple, 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 double, double. Maybe that business is actually going to be a great business. It's just growing at 30%, 60%, 15% a year. And then the P firm might have a thesis around combining a bunch of these companies like you talked about earlier. I want to take the last 10 minutes to process. Like, what does the process look like? What does the due diligence uh, look like? Is Does profitability matter? I've, I've seen like in the venture space, it's mostly growth, growth, growth. Um, it does, does profitability, how much is profitability matter? So walk us through the entire process here, because oftentimes people will say, and I've, I've been a part of one P uh, 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 exit in the past as well, P back company. Um, is it always that you do a majority uh, uh, takeover or buyout, or do you also sort of invest and let the founders take money off the table? Like what is the process? What are the options? Um, is it a rectal exam? Like everyone puts it out there. <laughs> I know it's not because I've worked with you. I know the kind of companies you back. I know the founders you back. That's why I invited you. Um, I think no two firms are the same, right? And it's important to pick the right partner who cares about the vision uh, and also know the motivation, right? If you go in the VC, you know, they want to triple, triple, double, double, double. You, you know, they want to each, uh, they want each investment to return the fund, you know, with private equity, they're good with like singles and doubles. They want to sort of maybe three to five, three to six X their investment. And so they're not going to stress you to hyper grow, but maybe there are other things there. So walk us through that whole process. Yeah, they, well, there's some great, great, great one-liners in there, Lloyd. Uh, I mean, to the point about the, the, the cavity check, um, look, it's no joke. I mean, you know, private equity, you know, got its, Got its kind of you know stereotype back in the late 80s or the 90s of kind of you know barbarians at the gate 
you know, like these kind of co corporate raiders that, that would, would come in, find these um, businesses that were kind of slightly mismanaged and, and kind of you know, squeeze out founders, change all the terms on them at the end of the, you know, retrade on terms. And you know, you know what, you know, that, that stereotype starting off in probably, you know, like the, um, the, the, the nineties, you know, probably hasn't gone away today for a good reason, you know, like, like any stakeholder engagement, right. You're going to have good actors and bad actors. Right. And I'm sure this all happens today. What I think has been really exciting is I, you know, connect with peers. I, you know, speak with a lot of folks in the industry. What I think has happened is, is actually what's, what's happened to enterprise sales as well. If, if, you're, if you think of enterprise software sales, if you think about it, you know, years ago, you used to do these like cloud deployments, right? Or sorry, like on-prem on deployments. And it would be, you know, you'd have this slick salesperson coming in, whining and dining, steak dinners, golfing. Like it's nothing actually about the utility or the functionality of the software. It's all about like what we can provide as a brand by partnering with us, trust, all these great buzzwords. Um, and you just kind of like get duped on the actual utility of the software. I mean, that just doesn't, well, that is changing today, right? And I think the adage is, you know, new school software sales is all about show, don't sell, right? It's why you can sign up for a free trial account of Twilio or Atlassian or Dropbox without even needing to speak to a sales representative from that company. And so that metaphor, I think, is happening or shift, causing this, uh, you know, a shift is occurring like that in, Know, pri private equity as well where you know of course there's like a, a level of opacity and you know terms that get retraded because investors as they dig in and keep learning more and more of the business find something new which has affected you know their, their valuation but what i'm what i'm starting to see is you know firms really start to say okay founders today have a lot more options to sell their company than they did ever before you know ipo m a sell to other private equity, you know, effectively competitor investment firms. And so optimizing for the founder user experience, the UX is also really important. And so I think, you know, it's something that we've tried to be quite intentional about at our firm at Bloom Venture Partners. I know a lot of other firms are doing incredible jobs here as well. It's just kind of saying, look, at the end of the day, we don't want to do any harm, both during the uh, conversation. And then if you do decide to partner with us, you know, post, post investment and, and, and sort of acquisition. And what that looks like is that you can come in and, and we'll give you a very explicit overview of what the process is going to look like, what documentation is required, what the timelines look like, who we're going to need, who we're going to need to meet from your, your team, for example, and all of that information is delivered up front. So it's kind of all moved, you know, front screen versus kind of hidden on the back end. In terms of, you know, timelines, I think, you know, the industry is also starting to really reduce, you know, the burdens, you know. Obviously, there's a, there's certain costs that come with selling a, a com, uh, selling a company, explicit costs, legal fees, accounting fees, get books in order, etc. Importantly, hidden costs, you know, the opportunity cost of what time is diverted from running the business to meetings with investment teams, meetings internally, discussing with a, a board or other founders or significant others about such a, a major life decision. Um, but in terms of a, a process, you know, usually you can kind of have. You know, Firms today, again, depending on how much diligence needs to happen, depending on the size of the business, but you know, you can move from you know within a couple of, of days to have a an LOI or a letter of intent, which basically outlines the, the headline terms of like what the structure of a of a transaction, to then doing all the diligence, do due diligence within you know, a couple of weeks, 30, 60 days, uh, all the legal docs, so kind of the asset or share purchase agreement, all finalized with respective buyer and seller legal teams. And then the actual close, meaning the actual wire is uh, well, like the, the actual money is then transferred across all within 60 days. So I think it's, a, you know, it is exciting that these things can, are starting to move a, a lot faster and with a lot more transparency and visibility on the process. Definitely. Now, in terms of um, costs and artifacts, like say you meet a founder, uh, you like the business, at what point do you sign a term sheet? And then what is the first set of artifacts you request and, uh, and advice for founders on who should they, who they should have by their side? Because a lot of founders I see, they don't have a proper finance person. So they can't, they're probably recognizing revenue cash based versus accrual based. They're not doing revenue recognition process properly. They can't frame the business. So who do you recommend one, at what point do you sign the term sheet? 
what are the immediate artifacts, the top three or five things you need to see? And what do you recommend founders? Like, who do you recommend they hire? Do they hire like a fractional CFO or a firm that specializes in putting this data room together? Um, like, so what are those top three there? Yeah, so mo most importantly, look, I, I think there's nothing wrong. If look, if a founder wants to take a meeting, if an investor reaches out and a founder wants to take a, me a meeting just to get a sense check of like, hey, what would the valuation be? You know, usually you can have a 30 minute conversation, sh founder shares some high level information if they're comfortable pre-NDA or an NDA gets signed, they share some information across, the, the, the investment team can come back and say really high level, like, you know, this is not a, a formal offer, but like high level, it's going to be between X and Y. And then they can kind of, you know, the founder can decide if they want to dig on from there. And that happens a lot. Founders will say like, hey, I'm exploring options. I might go and raise debt. I'm speaking with a couple of banks. I might go and raise growth equity. You know what, wildcard, why I'm here, let's just go and see what it'd be like to actually sell the business right now. Because you know, I'm just in the information, I'm fact finding, right? There's no problem there if the founder wants to do that. I think where a lot of the issues come from is where a founder, goes down the path and isn't actually 100% bought in with the concept of selling a business. And so they don't have a data room set up or easily in a position to get a data room set up. When I'm thinking about a data room here, this is basically an investment firm wants to come in and you know, there's fundamentally an information asymmetry. A founder has probably been in this business since day one. They know every single decision. They know all the cobwebs. Let's be real, there's a lot of cobwebs, right? Everything's duct taped together churn customers, security breaches, um, HR issues, whatever's going on. This is fine. It happens in every single business. But investors need to understand this before they're kind of underwriting the investment decision. So they'll come through and they'll, they'll want to get information like commercial information, legal information, um, IP, particularly around the, the, the technology, you know, how scalable is it, how secure is it, you know, what's, how, you know, what, what's the maintainability of the code base, who touches it, all these types of questions and, and that's where you can kind of go through extended due diligence we always recommend you know um being prepared it, it, it is just it is gr gruesome like you, you really need to spend like is selling a company like this is just you can't half ass it you, you really need to be like two feet jumping in and, and getting ready to um you know once you get to that point of like a signing a not like a binding letter of intent you know you basically got a 60 day 30 day shot clock it, it really is important to be like and, and we see it all the time where there's maybe two founders who say, hey, one of the founders is literally going to be taken out of the business. You know, they don't necessarily need to tell all the employees, but like for all intents and purposes, they will be like preparing a lot of these documentation. And, um, you know, I think that, that that can be, again, the the amount of DD requests really depends based on bias. You know, we always try to be really, really light. Right? We'll start light and then kind of dig in as we, as we need to. Definitely. Now, how do you typically structure the deal, right? Like how much do you pay up front and how much is deferred via earnouts? Yeah, great, great question. A um an earnout. So again, just a just a um quick quick definition of the uh, moment here. So earnouts is usually a structure where it's like you will get um or it's it, earnouts are typically performance based. So Hey, we're selling the business on first of January. It's you know, on the 31st of January, it's doing five million dollars flat. If the business hits six million dollars on December 31, the next year you'll get a performance-based earnout. And then, then you know it can be based on revenue amounts, it can be based on um, churn numbers, it can be based on profit numbers, any different way that the business you know, the investors are structuring it. We don't structure uh, businesses based on on earnouts. What we do is we say, hey, there's going to be um, a cash cash amount. Um, and we, we usually we would you know put some debt into a business. We we fund it with equity up front. You know amount goes directly to the founders to um, you know pay down existing debtors in the business. Um, any you know ESOP if there's come some sort of you know bonus plan for for employees getting an exit. Um, but then what we do we you know sometimes we can we we arrange if the founders say like hey we want to sell for X and X is like a little bit larger than than, than our multiple. What we can say is okay well we'll do. Um, uh, you know, effectively like a seller note where this, the seller effectively loans to the business and then uh, cash coming out of the business is then paid to the to the founders or to the sellers over a period of time. And it's not performance-based, it's purely time-based. So you see that quite a bit where founders will say, okay, we'll, we'll sell, you know, on day one, I get X dollars and then maybe a certain amount has been held back in a scrow for six months. And then I'm going to get two more kind of payments over the next 24 months or the 24 months post-close. 
that's pretty pretty common. We we generally don't do earnouts or haven't done today. Okay, awesome. Uh, two questions. I know we're at the top of the hour here. Um, how much do you think founders should budget to spend? Uh, right, like so. You you said some great things here. You you gave us a list of artifacts, like everything from sort of getting commercial ready, like from your IP, your scalability, your code base, to all your financial metrics, like, you know, get the revenue recognition, right? Like show basically how do you get, keep and go customers in a predictable way if you can. Um, you've, you've maybe hired a fractional CFO to help out get this data room together. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you don't have an in-house person who understands SaaS metrics and, and getting the finances in order, hire somebody fractional to, to do that. But then you also talked about 30 to 60 days, no shop clause, so this thing doesn't drag on. Now, what do you expect founders to spend in terms of legal fees through this process and just general fees? Ideally, as minimal as possible. Um, I mean, you know, we, we've dealt with businesses where there's multiple subsidiaries in different locations around the world. So you're dealing with multiple sets of, of law firms, obviously bill, bills run up really quickly. You know, we, we typically are trying to keep it, you know, in the low tens of thousands of dollars. And I've seen it run up well above $50,000, $100,000. That's where it gets quite complex. You, you're bringing in specialist tax advisory firms for multinational transactions. Um, you know, basically it kind of gets like, it's the continuum of simple to complex. If it's a simple, pretty vanilla transaction for again, a small business. Um, so there's kind of a two by two, like what's the size of the business, um, small, large, and then how complex, like simple versus complex. It's a large business and it's a complex transaction. It'll be in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Um, if it's a very you know, small business, sub five million, you know, it's it's a Delaware C, for example, here in America, and you know, it's, it's nothing too complex about it. Then yeah, you can get that done for low tens of thousands. Definitely, because um, you can you can drag it up as high as possible to account for every little thing. But your job as a founder is to realize how soon can we get to a go no decision and what's the minimal amount we can spend to get there and having your house in order with all the data room and everything else prior is really important. Uh, there were requests for fractional CFO recommendations. Let's take that offline. Email me at Lloyd at boast.ai. Bart, email me if you have some fractional CFO recommendations. I have a couple too, I yeah. but I think, I think they're worth their way in gold when you don't have that resource in-house and, and a fractional CFO or CFO or finance person is not somebody that's just doing your books and your taxes and your PNL. They're actually painting the picture of your forward looking, right? How do you get there? Um, the path to the vision so you can communicate with numbers better and I've suffered for it. And, and I, and so I'm saying it with a lot of pain. Um, and like the two, two things really quickly, cause I don't, I don't want to misrepresent and the founders be like, super worried about like, oh my gosh, it seems like so much work. Like I'm just going to push it off, you know, push it down the road. Two things. One, you can always partner up with an investment banker, right? Mm -hmm. some, some sort of firm. They will, you know, effectively you're paying them a percentage fee. Maybe there's a retainer up front and or a, a success fee upon the successful acquisition. And what they then do is they have their team of analysts and financial uh, you know, professionals that come in. They would do a lot of this data room development and management for you and then help connect your business out with potential buyers um, like firms like Bloom, what we're doing. Uh, we have relationships with tons of, of investment banks and various brokers um, representing you know, other software or technology founders. So that's one avenue. The second avenue is if you are just going to go direct, let's say you know, someone from our team reaches out and says, hey, let's have a chat. You're not going through and then being represented by a banker and paying them fees, you're doing it themselves. It's not a case if you don't need to, you don't need to have everything ready on day one. You know, it's our job as the investment professionals to kind of coach and guide you through and say, you know, here's, here's a list of 85, 120 things we're going to need. Here are the things to focus on in order. Let's just go through it. And we do, you know, every, every, basically every 48 hours, you're kind of on a call, just checking in on things. So definitely, um, you know, the goal is not, not to make it really painful to, to founders, but it's you know an inevitability when you're having that information asymmetry. And if it's a five-year-old business, there's obviously going to be a lot of data that needs to go through financial statements, employment contracts, customer contracts. Um, and obviously a lot of that work is all borne by the investment professionals who are scurrying behind the scenes, trying to get up the curve and understand what a great business is being built and how we can be supporters in the next chapter. 
you know, I think one thing to think about is as founders, especially if you're bootstrap, you're always running with no end in sight, right? Sometimes you got to step back and think about, hey, if I spent 30 to 60 days, can I really figure out what my business is worth and how that creates a personal success for me? And well, I think it's important to do that as a founder. Sometimes. I think you can work out if you're looking, if you're looking to just get a sense check of valuation, I think you can get that within 48 hours. Yeah. Um, it's usually like, it's then the point, if there's an agreed valuation to then go from like, here's what we're offering you to then we need to do all the diligence and then write up formal legal documents that can then take 30 to 60 days. So you don't need to go through 60 days just to understand what your business is valued at. That can be pretty quick. I mean, literally within 24, uh, 72 hours of the first meeting. Cause I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you don't do this, but you, you decide to raise venture capital and scale and you bring all these execs. Those execs will also want to know your business, like what's in your head. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes as capital efficient bootstrapped or founders who've raised very little money with not much board reporting, all this stuff is sitting in your head. It's just like, how do you bring this information out there? Uh, so, you know, one, you got to def de define to close it out your personal definition of success, get to an answer, yay, nay, quickly as possible. Maybe the first yay, nay is, does the valuation make sense? And then two, do I want to go and spend this sort of effort uh, to get, get this money <laughs> and create this success for me? Um, bankers is a great one. I had, I, I didn't even think of that, but yes, bankers exist to make this easier. Um, do you have recommendations for bankers or that's something you don't want to recommend and we can take it offline? I, I do. It's very stage and industry specific. So anyone is welcome to, to hit me up. Um, I'm either on, on Twitter or on email. Um, at my Twitter alias is at Bart McDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. And then email is Bart at bloombp.com. So Bart at bloombp.com, which is for Bart, partners. It's been such a great session, man. It was like an absolute masterclass. It's past 10 minutes past top of the hour and we still got a hundred people sticking around. Thanks for being a great friend. Thanks for being a great partner. Thank and uh, thank you for being just an awesome all around uh, investor, PE firm, supporter of the ecosystem. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.